Welcome to the inaugural Uncensored Podcast. I am Josh Hennig. Those who may or may not follow me over the years, uh, you may or may not know that I used to have a radio show called Josh Hennig Uncensored. It was on WIBG Radio from 2007 through 2011. I also named my blog site after Uncensored, so I thought, why not name podcast the same? I mean, come on, I'm full of original ideas, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, I'm looking forward to doing this every week. Uh, we got a very football-heavy show this week. The show is going to be very emphasized on quick hits. Not a lot of ranting and raving, uh, a lot more condensed opinion analysis on things going on in the sports world. We'll dabble into health and fitness as well, but a lot of those subjects we'll all cover in uh, separate videos here on my YouTube channel. Without further delay, I want to get into the very first topic, which is Chip Kelly, the Eagles head coach. I want you to hear this clip. After you hear this clip, I want to give you my initial reaction. So here's the clip. Bonds given no, not at all. No. And why not? I mean, because I think our quarterback's playing well. Over the, over the seven games you've I been, think our quarterback's been playing, playing well. Them. Yeah, I've been pleased with Sam. Very pleased with Sam. I can't believe he's he can honestly say this with a straight face. This is a guy who has been through multiple quarterbacks since he's been in Philadelphia. Okay? He has been through multiple scenarios with these quarterbacks. He's had Michael Vick. He's had Nick Foles. He's had Mark Sanchez. Now he has Sam Bradford as his starter. And yet, this is a man who wants to get up there and tell everybody, well, Sam's doing a good job. Sam, Sam's a good quarterback. Sam's doing a good job. I'm happy with the job he's done. To me, that is the sounds of a delusional man who is obsessed with not admitting he is wrong. His ego is so large, or he is so just blind, blindly believing that he has a good quarterback. I'm sorry, but Sam Bradford has nine touchdowns and ten interceptions. Wasn't it just a couple of years ago that Nick Foles only had a couple interceptions and 20-some touchdowns? Wasn't it just years ago that Chip Kelly was saying that Michael Vick is the fit for this offense? At what point are we going to be honest with ourselves? Okay? Sam Bradford is not playing well. Okay? Chip Kelly is not a good general manager. The, the realest reason why he took this job, we all know. Whether people want to admit it or not, is because Chip Kelly wanted power. Chip Kelly wanted final say over personnel. He didn't want somebody standing over his shoulder telling him what he should or shouldn't do. So at what point do we turn around and give Chip Kelly the grief that he deserves? Because at this point, I, I can't blame Sam Bradford anymore. Because Sam Bradford was put in this position. Sam Bradford is a decent quarterback. He was a very good college quarterback, but he is one of many very good college quarterbacks. Being very good in college, throwing over 40 touchdowns in a season in college, winning a Heisman Trophy in college does not equal NFL success. Tom Brady never won a Heisman, only started one year in college. Peyton Manning never won a Heisman, never won a national title in college. Phillip Rivers never won a Heisman, played for NC State. Russell Wilson never won a Heisman. Russell Wilson never threw 40 touchdowns in a season. Tim Tebow won a Heisman, won two national titles. He's not even in the league anymore. So like I said, at what point do we have an honest conversation about Sam Bradford? And this is what boggles me about the whole Chip Kelly situation. 
Chip Kelly is a man who can't admit that he's wrong. When they made the move to acquire when they made the move to acquire Sam Bradford, this Eagles team was supposed to be uplifted by it. That was supposed to be a move that was supposed to elevate this team to a place where Nick Foles couldn't take them. And I remember thinking when the trade went down, why Sam Bradford? And I tend to have that conversation in my mind and with others with any move Chip Kelly makes. Because the man does not evaluate NFL talent in the traditional method. He is still evaluating NFL talent as if these are college kids. And this is a problem. This is what Bart Scott has said. This is what Chris Carter has said. This is what numerous NFL analysts have said. College is different than the pros. You cannot treat the players. You cannot act around the players. You cannot talk to the players as if they're college kids. Chip Kelly is still trying to evaluate talent based on this crazy idea that I'm still in college. Well, listen, Chip, you can't do that. And that's why this team is 3-4. and four. That's why this team has almost no chance of making the playoffs. If they do make the playoffs, it's because the NFC East fell apart and the floodgates opened for them to get there. Because right now the Giants are leading the division. The Redskins are playing well. The Cowboys, they're probably not going to win the division, but when Tony Robo and Des Bryant come back, you know they're going to light up the division to prove a point. The Eagles, in their losses, have looked really bad. And in their wins, they've looked all right. The defense has played well. The Eagles have one of the top 10 defenses in the NFL statistically. They have one of the top 10 points against defenses. They have one of the top defenses in points against per game. And they have one of the top rushing defenses and preventing other teams from rushing the ball. But yet I'm supposed to sit here and believe that the genius, the mastermind that is Chip Kelly is going to resurrect Sam Bradford just like he was supposed to resurrect Michael Vick and resurrect Mark Sanchez and and get the most out of Nick Foles. Well, he did get out of the most out of Nick Foles. Because guess what? Nick Foles right now has six touchdowns and five interceptions for the St. Louis Rams. He did get the most out of Michael Vick. Because Michael Vick has been able to do nothing since he left Philadelphia with the Jets and with the Steelers. And we don't know about Mark Sanchez because we haven't seen him since last year. We haven't seen Mark Sanchez take a snap in 2015. So who knows about Mark Sanchez? This is what I do know. Chip Kelly, if he can't get over his own delusion and his own obsession with his system and his program and get around his ego and admit that he was wrong, he needs to see a shrink. I'm just saying. Speaking of delusions, let's talk about the fact that Ryan Mallett was released by the Texans. <laughs> this, to me, is one of the juiciest NFL stories on the planet. Ryan Mallett, coming out of college, was supposed to be this superb talent. He was a miss, not can't miss prospect. He had an amazing arm. He was a next the next pocket passer. It was not talked about when he was coming out enough was the fact that Ryan Mallett had one thing that nobody wanted to talk about. He had maturity problems. He had off-the-field problems. Ryan Mallett was a bit of a basket case in college. It was known that he had issues. There were stories. There were rumors. They were circulating for about two years during his last two years in college. It made a lot of people say, hmm, that could be a problem in the future. 
So as a result, when he got to the NFL, the Patriots picked him. And the Patriots kept him around for a little while, but they got rid of him. They didn't keep him around. They let him walk. Then Mallet was picked up by Bill O'Brien. And Bill O'Brien brought Mallet in and was like, hey, I'm going to develop this kid. I helped draft this kid. I helped scout this kid. And Ryan Mallet has been nothing but a knucklehead mess for them. That's why they had to release him. Ryan Mallet is just another quarterback with crazy great talent. Ryan Mallett may have a better throwing arm than the previously discussed Sam Bradford on the Eagles. Ryan Mallett's another super talented college quarterback who doesn't have what it takes to be an NFL quarterback. Because to be a great NFL quarterback is not just about talent. The greatest quarterbacks don't always win the Super Bowl. If that would have been the case, then Warren Moon would have won three. Jim Kelly would have won all four he went to. The most talented quarterbacks don't always win. It's a, it's a combination of talent, of preparation, of hard work, of environment, of the players and coaches around you. There are so many elements that go into the team game that is football that to say that just because a guy is talented is the reason why he's going to be great is short-sighted. And the obsession over Ryan Mallett, I never understood it. Yeah, I saw the throwing arm in college. But I was if you watch game tape, and this is why I always tell people, we get so obsessed with workouts and with interviews and with the combine. Don't we learn everything from game tape? That, 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 that's what the pro coaches do. That's what the analysts do. That's what everybody else does at the pro level. Except when it comes to bringing in quarterbacks. If you watch Ryan Mallett's tape, you would have seen the guy was immature. He didn't have the best attitude. He was a punk at times. He would make he would try to force throws in there because he thought he could make it because he had a big throwing arm. So why am I surprised that he hasn't done well at the NFL level? I'm not. Speaking of college football. Before we get to my NFL picks, and before we get to my little quick thought on Game 1 of the World Series, what is up with the obsession in the line for Notre Dame? Notre Dame is favored by more than a touchdown at Temple this Saturday. Do we not forget that for three quarters, Clemson shut down the Notre Dame offense? The only reason that game was 24-22... Notre Dame over uh, Clemson over Notre Dame was because of the fact that Notre Dame scored 19 points in the fourth quarter. Clemson played a prevent defense almost the entire fourth quarter and almost gave the game away. Notre Dame is in the greatest offense in the world. In fact, the only game in which they gave up less than 20 points was against a horrible Texas offense in their first game of the season. Now, as we know, Texas has gotten a lot better since then. So comparing, you know, you can literally throw that game out. Just toss that game in the trash, because that game is useless to compare for. It amazes me that we live in a world where people are still stuck in the past. Notre Dame has been the one national championship game in the last... 20 years. Notre Dame is on their second quarterback of the season. They have a defense that has allowed a lot of points overall. It's not like Notre Listen, Notre Dame gave up 20 something points to UMass. But they held Texas to three. Something doesn't add up there. I think, I, I would almost take this to the bank. This Temple Notre Dame game is going to be a lot closer than people think. It's in Philadelphia. Notre Dame has really only played a couple big games on their entire schedule. 
And those two big games were a lot closer than people expected. That USC game was a lot closer than people expected. And then when they lost to Clemson, they were losing badly for most of that game. So, as a result, I, I, can't, I can't see Notre Dame beating Temple by over nine points. I don't see it. I'm sorry. All right. Cue the football music. NFL picks time. Gotta love NFL films. All right. So each week on the podcast during the NFL season, uh, we do this game midweek so we can get in all of the NFL picks. All right. So let's start with Thursday night, New England versus Miami. Uh, you got to go with the Patriots. Patriots are at home. Dolphins, yeah, they've won the last few games, but both of those games have been against uh, mediocre teams, let's say. Okay, I'm sorry, but the Titans and the Texans are not playing well this year. Uh, I mean, that AFC South may be the worst, tal- not talent-wise, but the worst playing division in the NFL. It might be worse than the NFC East. So I, I got to go with the Patriots. They're at home. I think the Dolphins will put up an interesting fight. I think they'll make it an interesting game. But uh, I don't think Dan Campbell has what it takes to beat the Patriots on a short week. Chiefs are hosting the Lions, where it's another 9:30 game. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not thoroughly impressed by these London games. Although the Jags Bills game was exciting, and, and Yahoo did a good job with it. I, personally, I'm going with the Lions in this game. It's not even in Kansas City. I, Kansas City is not is is a it's it is a empty. Hollow home game for the Chiefs. I gotta go with Lions. I think that the Chiefs are just not playing very cohesive away from home, and I think having to travel to London is really gonna mess them up. You know, the the international presence of this game is really gonna be a problem for the Chiefs. I think the Lions are coming around. I think they're finally finding their way. Uh, Tampa Bay at Falcons. Very easy. Falcons are the better team. Falcons are at home. Bucks. they just lost a tough game last week. In the interdivisional game, the Bucks will give it a shot, but the Falcons... The Falcons are going to put up better numbers than last week against the Titans, so they're going to take that out on the Bucks. Vikings, Bears. Uh, I, I'm going to take the Vikings on the road at the Bears. While I wouldn't be surprised if Chicago won at home, I do think that the Vikings are the better team overall. I think the quarterback situation between the two teams is a toss up at this point. Even though Teddy Bridgewater has come a long way. I just do not like the Bears defense. I don't like the Bears ability to win at home in tough games. Cincinnati at the Steelers. I'm going to go with Cincinnati because they're coming off a bye. This is probably going to be Ben Roethlisberger's first game back. So you should expect him to be a little rusty. Not at his best. The Steelers had a, had a rough game against the Chiefs. Like I said, the Bengals coming off a of bye week. Bye weeks are a big deal for a lot of teams. Marvin Lewis has a winning record as a head coach coming off a of bye week. Let's go with the Bengals there. Cards at Browns. Arizona Cardinals coming off a of big win at home. Browns, lackluster season. Arizona is the better team, better quarterback, better roster, better offense, better defense, better team wins. Let's go with the Cardinals there. Titans at Texans. I'm going with Texans. I think the Texans are going to win this game just because I really, really do feel like getting rid of Ryan Mallett is going to change the fortunes of this team. Okay? I really do feel like getting rid of a guy like Ryan Mallett is going to help this team in the locker room going to help Brian Hoyer's maturity. It's going to help him feel even more strong about having this starting quarterback job. I think the Titans, they've had a couple of rough weeks. This is not the same Titans team that blew out the Buccaneers in week one. They've been on a huge slide. The Texans are going to step up at home and beat them. 49ers at Rams. Rams win at home. Rams coming off a bye. Rams have a really good defense. 49ers offense has been in flux. Anquan Bolden, he's not playing very well in this offense. Colin Kaepernick has not been the same quarterback he's been in years past. 
Rams defense is going to take it to them. Remember the, Ram Remember the Rams did this in Seattle earlier this year. You think San Francisco has a chance? Come on, man. Rams win. Giants at Saints. Um, to me, this is a toss-up game. The only reason I'm going Giants is because I feel like the Giants, coming off the win against the Cowboys, you, you have that positive going for you, that positive feeling. Yeah, the, the Saints have a positive feeling after the Colts game as well, but the Saints have not been the same team at home. The Colts almost beat him. I think Eli Manning's going to have a huge day against a lackluster Saints defense, and I don't think a Saints offense is just going to be able to keep up enough in a shootout. You may see this game be like a 42-35 win for the Giants. Chargers at Ravens. I think the Ravens finally get off the snide. Teams traveling from the West Coast to the East Coast do not always do well. I don't have a lot of confidence in the Chargers traveling from West to East. The Ravens are very frustrated after the last couple losses. These, these losses are coming in very close games. I think the Ravens finally get off the snide. They find a way to beat the Chargers, and they win at home, get their second win on the season. Jets go to Oakland. I am going with the statistically number one team in the NFL, the Jets, on the road. I'm not a fan of teams traveling from east to west coast usually, but I just feel like the Jets come away with a moral victory after losing to the Patriots. I don't think the Raiders know what's coming. The Jets have one of the best defenses in the NFL, one of the top secondaries in the NFL. I don't think the Raiders are going to have a very easy time scoring at all. You may see a bunch of Janikowski field goals. You may see Latavius Murray gain, gain a run here or there. You may see Derek Carr throw a touchdown, but I don't think the Raiders can put up enough points. I see a Jets, you know, like a 28-17 win there. Seattle at Dallas. Got to go Seattle. Seattle's going to get back to 4-4. Four four. Dallas, Dallas looks bad, man. This is a team without Tony Romo is just totally dysfunctional. That offense just cannot function without Tony Romo. Seattle is making a turn around the bend. They want this game just to prove a point because Dallas beat them in previous years. Got to go Seattle. And just because Dallas is playing poorly. Green Bay at Denver, Sunday Night Football on NBC. Another coin flip game, but I'm going the Broncos. I think the Packers are going to meet their match. I think that this Broncos defense is going to limit the Packers' ability to score. I think the Broncos are going to find a way to score on the Packers' defense. I think the Packers' defense has been a bit inflated statistically. I think they've played some... Weak opponents this year, which has helped their stats and how they look to the rest of the NFL. I think the Broncos are going to be able to limit the Packers' ability to run the ball. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to have a decent game. He'll throw a couple touchdowns, but it's not going to be enough because the Broncos are going to force a turnover here and there. The offense is going to get moving a little bit. Broncos, in my opinion, have one of the best defenses in the NFL, and they're at home. Packers in the past few years, they have not traveled as well as they did about four years ago. The last couple years, they haven't been as well on the road. Broncos at home. And then, Monday Night Football on ESPN. Panthers, Colts, I'm going Panthers at home. Panthers have the defense that will give the Colts offense fits. I think the Colts are going to put up points, especially in the second half. But the Colts defense, well, they can't stop a fly, so... I'm going to say Panthers going to win probably like 35-27. And those are my NFL picks. NFL Week 8. Oh, man. It's already halfway through the season. Can you believe it? No, seriously, it is halfway through the season. It's nuts. All right, before I let everybody go, um, I do want to encourage everyone to read my article I just wrote on my blog site about the Miami head coaching situation. Uh, the firing of Al Golden had to be done. Al Golden had to get going. <sighs> Nothing against Al Golden personally, but he wasn't the man for the job. I think Al Golden is a guy who's a great rebuilding head coach. I think Al Golden knows how to take a football program that has been down on their luck and raise the level of play. But I don't think Miami was the job for him. Just like I didn't think Randy, Randy Shannon or Larry Coker were the best men for those jobs. Because 
Miami needs a coach who's going to do more than just be a specialist. I know everyone's talking about, oh, you know, they really need an offensive-minded coach. Well, that's all well and good. But you know what? If that coach can't recruit, if that coach can't relate to players, if that coach can't get the administration to back this football program and help them improve facilities and get a different stadium to play in, none of it matters, man. Miami is the biggest college football job with the absolute worst football environment. Their stadium is almost an hour away from campus. Their facilities are subpar at best for Division I football standards. Okay? You are competing for recruits against major football programs such as Florida State, Florida, Georgia, Alabama. You have a lot of competition going on here. I don't see how Miami is going to get better without the right head coach. And I'm sorry, but Al Golden, Randy Shannon, Larry Coker, John Gruden, all these big names, they're not the right guys for the job. Thanks for checking out this inaugural edition of the Uncensored Podcast. I'm Josh Henning, wrapping up. We try to keep it under a half hour each and every week. I'll catch you next week. Try to get a little more baseball next week. Josh Hennig, catch you next time.